Winston Churchill once said, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. This quote resonates with me because I think we can get mired in the day-to-day and lose track of our impacts. Hi, I'm Jimmy Butler, and welcome to this presentation on the future of performance management. It's a topic I'm very passionate about, and over about the next half hour, I want to help you rethink how IT success is measured. It is October 2021, and I'm currently serving my clients as a strategic management consultant working for a Lethix and IntelliBridge company. My mission is to help people think and act strategically so they can better discover and deliver the next right thing. I'll do this through coaching or consulting on strategic planning, alignment, execution, product management, and performance measurement. As a backdrop to this presentation, I want to tell you a little story behind the book I wrote, Pursuing Timeless Agility, The Path to Lasting Agile Transformation. A few years ago, I uh, was through my own observation and experience and that of my colleagues. We, we were noticing that what a lot of people were calling Agile just wasn't Agile. And after looking through the annual state of Agile reports that come out every year by version one and the data around you know, what people are doing, why they're doing it, how they measure success, I was seeing some contradictions. And I was also seeing that my point was validated, that a lot of what people were doing was for the wrong reasons and they were getting the wrong outcomes as a result. So I wrote the book to help walk through what the problem was and help the reader understand where their organization might be sitting within that spectrum and then to figure out, okay, now what do we do from here? Now that we're off the rails, how do we get back on track? What are some steps we can take? But the last chapter of the book I wrote on measuring success. And I also complemented that with a presentation I did somewhere around the same time about how to measure success in agile teams. Now this is something that I did a recorded version of. I threw it up on YouTube not for marketing purposes or to promote it, because I actually never promoted it. It was just a place to point people to that, that, that I was working with. But organically, that presentation has gotten over 15,000 views. And then I did a shorter video in a related topic about measuring uh, success, and that's gotten 11,000 views. And I tell you this because it just it brings home the point that this is a topic that resonates. People are very interested in how to measure success, they realize that a lot of the uh, traditional success metrics might not be doing what they should be doing. And so this particular presentation won't get into the weeds that those did. I want to bring it up a layer or two, but I want to talk about a new problem I'm seeing. I want to talk about why it's a problem. I'm going to lay out a vision for a future state, and then I want this to begin a conversation about how we get there from here. Now this is a rhetorical question since we can't interact on it, but I want you to think about how do you measure success today? What are your current success measures within your team, within your programs, within your organization? Now often when I ask this question, I'll hear things like how well we're doing of planned versus actuals. Or do we have happy customers? Are we releasing uh, with no defects? What is the frequency of releases? What's our velocity? Are we meeting mission goals, staying within budget, collaboration among stakeholders improving? Uh, are we delivering value? Those are the types of things that I'll receive. What are those for you? Another question to think through is, what does the future of performance management look like to you? You know, given how we do things today, where do you see this going? Is it that there's artificial intelligence and, and machine learning coming into play? Are we doing more dynamic dashboards? Or are we really just trying to tie our mission goals better to product delivery? Are we showing better team alignment? What are those things for you? Gordon Bethune is a retired airline executive known for one of the most dramatic corporate turnarounds in history at Continental in the 1990s. He's quoted as saying, most businesses fail because they want the right things, but they measure the wrong things and they get the wrong results. And you may have heard the name Peter Drucker. Many would call him the father of management thinking. He has once said, there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. How we measure success determines what we do. See, we can be good at doing things, but are they the right things? You may have read the book or watched the movie Moneyball. It is a baseball story, but it has a lot of parallels for the topic today. The 2002 Oakland Athletics had just lost a few of their key marquee players, and they had one of the most 
limited budgets in all of Major League Baseball. So they had to figure out how were they going to win ball games with a limited budget when they needed money to acquire players to produce. And at the time, most of the teams would evaluate players based on their athleticism. Are they big, strong, fast, did they throw hard, hit hard? And they'd make purchasing decisions based on those attributes. And the better players in that category cost you more money. The A's knew they couldn't compete with that. They had to get more creative. So they knew they had to win ball games. And in order to win ball games, you have to score runs. And so they went into the data and they tried to figure out, is there a metric that would be a good predictor of a player's ability to score runs? And they found that on-base percentage was that indicator. And because most teams weren't looking at that, they were able to get players at a discount. And they built their team around that and had a great success that year. Now, their approach, it went against common wisdom, but it changed baseball statistics forever. We now know baseball as one of the most complex statistical enterprises out there. Their, their stats are geared toward helping to predict a player's impact on wins. In other words, their strategic objectives. So we can think of players as IT investments, your portfolio, your software development efforts. The questions are, do you know how each of your investments impacts your wins, your organizational strategic objectives? Do you know how specific capabilities that you develop contribute to those measures? And so the lessons of Moneyball are that when we measure the wrong things, we make the wrong investments, and we get undesired results. It's been a while, but Microsoft did an internal study that showed, based on the situation, 60 to 90% of ideas do not actually improve the metric they were intended to improve. So smart people were coming forward with great ideas and great solutions, but when they followed that post-deployment to see did it actually do what they thought it was going to do, they were wrong. And I think we're probably better at this today than Microsoft was back then, but it's still a problem, right? We come forward with great ideas, but in many times we're not actually moving the metric we intended to improve. We're not actually achieving the outcome that we thought we were. And in, what's worse is we actually a lot of times don't even know because we're not measuring it. So if we're going to achieve strategic success, we have to be able to move the metrics we intend to move, right? Another study once suggested that 90% of organizations fail to execute their strategies. That's just dismal. And as a strategic management consultant, I spend a lot of time understanding this dilemma. I think the root problem is awareness and alignment. Think to yourself for a second. Can you name your strategic objectives? Whether it's your division, your department, your organization as a whole, what are they? And do you know the success measures for those strategic objectives? How is success measured? How are you impacting those success measures? There was a company one time did an internal survey within their management layer and they learned that about half of them couldn't even name one of their top five strategic objectives. Another study showed that less than 5% of the entire staff of an organization knew what those strategic objectives were. I think one of the biggest problems in performance management is related to the streetlight effect. Now there's this quirky story, maybe you've heard it, that helps describe what this is. And of course I'm gonna use it here. So there's this guy out late at night, he's under a streetlight, and he's digging around in the bushes and in the grass. And a cop comes along and is like, buddy, what are you doing? And the guy's like, I lost my keys. And the cop's like, oh, okay, well I'll help you look for them. And so they spend about the next 10 or 15 minutes just digging around in the bushes and the grass, everywhere the light's shining. And they don't find any keys. And so the cop's like, yo, buddy, are you sure this is where you lost your keys? Well, the guy says, well, no, I lost them over there, but this is where the light is. And so the point is, is we tend to look where it's easiest to see. So when it comes to our measures, we will measure what we easily understand, what we can easily collect, and what we can easily chart. But it's not always helpful, is it? This cartoon's an oldie but goodie, but I think it exemplifies the streetlight effect. The boss comes in and says, you know, Sally, your output's not cutting it. You only produce 15 lines of code. And she's saying probably very sarcastically, what, the 15 lines of code that cured cancer? He's like, yeah, that. We need more. This is that outputs versus outcomes thinking. It's not always malicious. It's just what we know. 
right? And ironically, lines of code was a real thing at some point. Hopefully it's not anymore. But just think about that. A senior developer should be able to produce something with fewer lines of code than a junior developer, yet would be seen as less productive, right? So the streetlight effect is that we would measure something that's easy to measure, right? Lines of code's a lot easier to measure than some impact on the cure for cancer. Now, I was reminded of the streetlight effect over the summer of 2021 when the Agile Alliance put on what they called the Minimum Viable Conference. And one of the talks on there was about business value points. And the speaker noted right up front, you know, knowing what the real value, tangible value of a thing is, that would be great, but it's hard. And so instead, we will use business value points. And I immediately thought of the streetlight effect. We're measuring what we can easily understand, capture, and track versus what might actually matter. Now, if you're not familiar with business value points, it's just a subjective, relative, weighted prioritization technique. So you might say, okay, here's the items in my backlog. This one here I think is really important. This is going to have a lot of impact on the business. So I'm going to give it a 10. And this one is important, but not as quite as much. So it's a seven and maybe this one's a five and so on and so forth. And then the team would say, okay, for this iteration, out of all the things we're committing to, we, we have a total of 50 business value points for the work we're, we're planning. Maybe they only deliver 40 business value points at the end of the iteration. And then they would say, well, we delivered or we captured or we earned 80% of the business value of this increment. Now, this is a real measure. This is what teams are doing. And I applaud the fact that they're thinking about business value or trying to trying to you know, quantify the, the, the impact or the value of a thing. But the business value points are really still just a subjective relative weighted prioritization technique because we can only really know value post-deployment, right? The Hawthorne effect goes right along with the streetlight effect many times in our performance measures. So in a similar vein, the boss says, we have to increase our velocity. And the team thinks about it and they have a great idea. Well, we'll just do bigger estimates. Now, I imagine the boss was looking for a different outcome or a different behavior. He's probably looking for actually getting more work done. What he got was just a bigger number. We will measure the wrong things for the wrong reasons many times. And the behavior we get is this Hawthorne effect says that if you tell me how you measure me, I'll tell you how I'll behave. That I will change the way I operate in order to help meet that measure. So what you end up with is just bigger estimates instead of what you were really looking for, and it was more velocity. Because we aren't really moving the desired metric for the outcomes we're intending as a result. But it's not all doom and gloom. According to the pulse of the profession from PMI, 77% of mature Agile organizations say they met their intended goals. Well, why do they have a different view of success than what the other studies were indicating? Our perspective determines how we define success. It's about who is responsible for what in our eyes. So we talk about the business and IT as these two ends of the spectrum where we say, well, it's the business's responsibility for the mission need and the value proposition. The product owner needs to bring forward the important things and prioritize it for us. And then we then get great at the effectiveness and efficiency of our delivery. We have good pace. We're delivering frequently. We got great quality. And so when we do those things well, right, we're measuring business value delivered. We're measuring our deployment frequency, our automated code coverage. When we see ourselves as effective in that way, of course, we're going to say we're meeting our goals and intent. To further demonstrate how our industry is measuring success, I've pulled six years worth of data from the annual State of Agile survey that's put out by version one. And on the topic about how success is measured in Agile projects, initially it was things like velocity, iteration burn down, release burn down as the primary measures of success. But those things dove off at about 2018. And then we had business value and customer satisfaction become the top two choices. On the related question of how success is measured in Agile transformations, we see a similar pattern. Where number one in, the, in 2015 was about on-time delivery, it later became about business value and customer satisfaction. So it seems like we're headed in the right direction. We're talking about business value and customer satisfaction and all the great product-minded keywords, but the question is, 
What do we mean by customer and what do we mean by value? Well, what do you mean by customer? Who would you consider your customer? Responses that I'll often get are things like, it's the people who provide us the money. It's the system owner, it's the business owner, it's the internal users, partners, the public, or maybe there's something else. The Agile Manifesto talks about customer a good bit. It talks about customer collaboration over contract negotiation. It talks about satisfying the customer with continuous delivery. It talks about harnessing change for the customer's competitive advantage. The Agile Manifesto's writers intended customer to be the person providing the budget or the requirements. It's that internal business customer. And that's often still our view today. And what do we mean by value? You know, we talked earlier about business value points as a metric. We also have our delivering on commitments, planned versus actuals, the volume of work, the timeliness of the work, the quality of the outputs. And is that business customer happy? It's their satisfaction. I find many times that the performance measures that Agile teams have usually stop at delivery. They're measuring things between intake and when they deploy, you know, but it stops at delivery. It's about the things we do. But the most important thing I want you to take away from this presentation is that value is not in what you do. Value is in what is achieved as a result of what you do. See, your production stats are great. Your operational metrics are important. We have to get effective and efficient at what we do. But are you scoring runs and winning games? Are you achieving your outcomes and your strategic objectives? Do you even know? And I've heard the arguments, right? Those outcomes are the business's responsibility. But is it? And should it be? Mark Schwartz is the former CIO of Citizenship and Immigration Services. He's written a few books, one of which is called A Seat at the Table. I want to look at a few quotes from that book. He said, we came to speak about IT and the business as two separate things, as if IT were an outside contractor. The contractor control model led inevitably to the idea that IT should be delivering customer service to the enterprise. And I've heard many people say, but we are service providers, right? We do provide customer service to the enterprise. We're, we get ITIL certified. Well, but Mark goes on to say that the customer service model is a value trap because it sets up a frame of reference that actually prevents IT from achieving its potential value. Well, what is that potential value? You know, Steve Jobs once said, it doesn't do any good to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. And I've seen in organizations even today where the smart people are deciding what to do and they just hand over requirements to the delivery teams to deliver. But is that really the way it should be? And I know we've come a long way with empowering our teams on technical solutions, but what about strategy? Can our technical teams help drive strategic thinking, product visions, helping to make sure we're solving the right problems? McKinsey did a study once on the role IT should play. It notes that IT rarely works as a partner with the business, but most executives believe it should. We see that about 49% of the respondents indicate that their IT organizations are basically just suppliers managed by the business. But an overwhelming majority of them believe that IT should be a partner who actively collaborates with the business to shape overall strategy. The study goes on to say that IT is much likelier to share accountability for the initiatives when it acts as a partner with the business. And of those that are seen as partners in the business, the overwhelming majority of them do collaborate on those initiatives and are held accountable. There's a quote here on the left from the Lean Enterprise. It says that in high performance organizations today, people who design, build, and run software-based products are an integral part of the business. They are given and accept responsibility for customer outcomes. You see, success isn't just in what we do. It's not just about our delivery. It's in being accountable to what is achieved as a result of what we do. The future of performance management is this, that the notion of business and IT will go away. IT is the business, and the business is IT. See, within our missions and the capabilities we offer, technology is just integral. It's interwoven. This quote from IT Governance says that in the future, describing how much an enterprise spends on IT will be meaningless. It's because IT won't be this service that's bought. 
right? It's integral to the business solution. So we might fund things like value streams, the problem to solve, the mission outcomes to achieve. Those would be our investments. Or maybe it's the cross-functional teams that are made up of more than just IT folks. It won't be about an IT budget. The operational metrics we have will still matter because we need to be effective and efficient at what we do. But our primary success measures will be tied to strategic objectives. And so that's the key shift for our teams. The primary measure of your success is in achieving the strategic objectives because it does not matter how effective and efficient you are at delivery. If it doesn't move the metric toward achieving the outcome, well, what's the point? As we move away from being cost centers and into this service provider space that many of us sit and then onward toward being that business partner, we now factor in not just great delivery, but how are we meeting mission outcomes and validated return on investment? I'm working with a client today on this vision. Where their vision was once about being the best delivery organization, it is now about being a trusted partner focused on validated return on investment. And so we build a strategy and an execution framework around achieving that vision. So how do we get there from here? I believe it centers around the transition to a product mindset. It means we're going to improve our strategic awareness and alignment at all levels. We're going to focus on outcomes over outputs to improve our return on investment impacts. You see, we have to demonstrate and prove that we belong at the table. It's not going to be handed to us. And we're going to do this by showing that we understand and how we can help meet those objectives and measures that matter the most to the organization. For strategic alignment, it's about being enterprise aware. And enterprise awareness comes through having a great strategic management framework at all levels of your organization. And my clients, I use the balanced scorecard for the longer term visioning and why we're doing what we're doing. Married with objectives and key results or OKRs for the execution layer and to help make sure that everyone is staying focused on the, sh the things that matter for the organization. This brings visibility and awareness, accountability. It creates a new daily routine. And this feeds into our product visions where we're looking at what problems are we trying to solve? What opportunities are we trying to capture? Our outcomes-based product roadmaps with measurable strategic objectives in mind. And it is everyone's concern. Everyone should be aware of what these objectives are and how to measure success so that they understand that how what they do impacts that. And where we've implemented this, the conversations have been enlightening. Like, we're having conversations about well, what are the real outcomes of doing this thing? Is that really the right outcome we're after? Is it the best benefit? Who's really benefiting? And how do we know when we're successful? Outcomes over outputs is very central. It's not just about your strategies or your product visions. It, it touches your epics, your user stories, your measures of success. Why are you doing what you're doing? What is the thing you deliver supposed to impact or achieve? I like to ask the questions of what problem are we trying to solve? What is the measure we're intending to improve or impact? How do we know when we've actually achieved the outcome we're after? We might be trying to impact our cost. Maybe it's user adoption and retention, product usage. Maybe it's net promoter score, you know, customer satisfaction, user satisfaction. There's a strategic theme that one of my clients has has taken on to, and it's called Seek to be Chosen. And this happens to be a government client, and so when you think about government services, especially to the public, you really don't have a choice, do you? If you need that service that that government organization offers, and they give you a website and a way to do it, well, that's the only way to do it. And what I've found in the past is that the user experience can be lacking probably because there's no competition. But what if there were? I asked my government clients to consider what if there was competition for the service you were offering? How would that change the way you think about the way you manage your product? How would that change the way you measure success for that product? Maybe it would move you more away from doing more things to doing more of the right things. Implementing OKRs, objectives and key results, is a great way to help make sure that teams are focused on those outcomes that are tied to those strategic objectives. Because what you are doing 
has to have a purpose and you have to understand what success looks like. And then there's return on investment. You know, what is that quantifiable impact you're trying to make to the business, to the end user, to the mission, to some strategic objective? And admittedly, this is the harder challenge. It is hard to quantify return on investment in many cases, especially if you don't have baselines. And I've seen many instances where baselines don't exist for the types of things we need to measure. And so we have to start with creating those baselines so we can understand the problem that we actually have and what target we might be wanting to shoot for and whether or not we are actually achieving it. But I encourage you to not sit under the streetlight on this one. It's hard, but we have to measure what matters. And so come out from underneath the streetlight and figure out how are you going to get your baselines so that you can work toward how are you going to impact those baselines. From a return on investment perspective, you have run the business activities and you have changed the business activities. We know that we have to, to keep the things we already have running, but we also have great ideas that are going to impact the business in a big way. Maybe we need a big cost reduction in some area. Maybe we need to improve adoption of a product to increase our return on investment. Whatever the case may be, the change the business type of investments are those ones where you've got to predict what is that post-deployment value of this thing? What is, what is it that I hope, uh, what measure am I hoping to move by delivering this thing? And being able to understand, well, it has a cost to deploy. There'll be a payback period to recoup those savings. And then there's going to be a run the business support effort. There's also going to be considerations about, well, I could do this thing or that thing or this other thing. Which one should I do first and in which order? So there's a cost of delay for not doing one thing over another. There's opportunity costs, right? All more complicated than I can get into in this particular presentation. But these are the types of things that, yeah, your teams can start thinking about these things and start being able to be a part of that conversation to help guide the overall organization on making the right decisions for the right reasons. So the key takeaways are this. Have a product mindset. Remember, value isn't in what you do. Value is in what is achieved as a result of what you do. So align to and actively manage to strategic objectives and be accountable to the outcomes. Track real return on investment wherever possible. Create those baselines and figure out ways to improve upon them. But whatever your pace, just make sure you're moving in the same direction. And let this just be the start of a conversation to figure out how to find your seat at the table. Your journey is ahead, but let's rethink what success looks like and act accordingly. And I know we're not in a live interactive mode at this point, but I would love to hear what resonated most with you about this presentation. Feel free to reach out to me and connect with any of the, the means here on this slide. And I look forward to the ongoing conversation. Thank you.